Hello and welcome to Enlightened Empaths, your community for the spiritually awakened, where we discuss, explore, and connect with fellow empaths, healers, intuitives, and seekers. Hello, empaths. We're so excited that you decided to join us once again this week. We have a very fascinating, intelligent, and intriguing guest to introduce you to. Peter Canova is on the show today to help us unravel the nature of reality through the twin lenses of quantum physics and ancient spiritual wisdom. As a leading expert on Gnostic and other ancient spiritual traditions, he travels the country as a speaker on topics like parallels between Gnostic mysticism and quantum physics, the sacred feminine, Mary Magdalene and the lost woman of the Bible, and the secret teachings of Jesus. His new book, Quantum Spirituality, helps us transcend materialistic science and the dead-end dogmas of traditional religion. Wow. Welcome to the show, Peter. Hi, Samantha. Nice to be with you today. You know, you have quite a successful background in the business world, and now you've transitioned into this new world. Can you just start us off by sharing how you got on this path after years of working in the business world? Yeah, well, actually, it started long ago and far away when I was in my 20s. And um, I discovered that I was uh, a very accurate medical intuitive. Um, it happened in the context of a um, uh, a group that I was in that was involved in um, research into uh, psychic research, let's call it. And uh, it was, uh, I didn't really have any antecedents to this. I mean, I didn't have anything in my life before then that would have indicated this was something that I'd be able to do with that kind of facility. But uh after my logical mind took a back seat and let my intuitive self have full reign and come forward, I started manifesting all different kinds of phenomena, um, clairvoyance, clairaudience, telemetry, remote viewing, premonitions. Uh, and I started realizing that, that there's a whole other world out there. There are other dimensions out there that I was tapping into. And sometimes I was actually more in those dimensions really than I was in this one. But um, being the Capricorn that I am and wanting to understand the nuts and bolts behind how all this was happening, not just having the experiences, but understanding, you know, what was the context of these experiences? How how can this all be possible? I started studying ancient uh, spiritual traditions, particularly Gnosticism. And uh, that led me to quantum physics. And the nexus there is that ancient spiritual traditions and quantum physics have three things in common. They What they really are about is the study of light, energy, and matter. And one of them, which is, which is quantum physics, approaches these issues, which can get, you know, get very metaphysical, approaches these issues from uh, an objective or scientific background. The spiritual wisdom traditions obviously approach it from a subjective or intuitive background but what i noticed is uh in in my readings of the gnostic text they were really describing almost every major theory of quantum physics three thousand years ago the big bang parallel universes the god particle the, the einstein's energy matter equation e equals mc squared these were all covered in the gnostic text in non-technical terms and uh you know, I'm a believer that where there's smoke, there's fire. I mean, these are deep mysteries we're talking about, and none of us will ever know for sure what the what the ultimate nature of reality is. We probably can never really know that, but we can get we can get an approximation of it. We can we can you know we can get the footprints and follow those put footprints, and um, when we start to get results in the material world as a result of those excursions into these other dimensions, then you start to get proofs and validations that there really is something there. And I, and I've, I've had these proofs and validations, you know, really throughout my life. I mean, it really contributed a lot to my business success, contributed to saving my life on occasions. And, um, you know, I know a lot of people listening to me right now who haven't had these experiences, you know, it's abstract to them, but believe me, once you do, have these experiences with higher consciousness you own them and you understand that the level of what we think of rea is reality is only one layer of the cake and the i wrote the book quantum spirituality just for the purpose of helping people have their own extraordinary experiences with higher consciousness a really strong 
attribute sense of that book is that anyone can pick it up. It's not geared towards someone that has a really strong background in quantum physics or that is you you could start at the beginning with this or if you have a base of knowledge you can jump in a little bit deeper so just for the listeners who may not understand what what that quantum spirituality really is could you give us just a little tiny brief abridged version of of what your description would be for it yeah well quantum spirituality is very simply a roadmap it's a roadmap to having experiences with higher consciousness. And like any map, you have to have at least a couple of coordinates, okay? You want north and south, east and west, latitude and longitude, and so forth. Uh, if you're operating off a single point, it's not as effective as seeing the whole arena. So what I really tried to do here was to create a multidisciplinary um, text that involves quantum physics, ancient spiritual traditions, Jungian depth psychology, neuro, neurobiology, uh, and, and cross-reference these. So it's really connecting a lot of dots. And that's the power of the book. I mean, I'm sure any individual that reads this book will zero in on any one aspect of it and say, oh, hey, I'm, re I'm really clued on to that. But what the power of the book is, is that it's got multiple dots to connect. And, and when you connect those multiple dots, what you have is a matrix of awareness or a matrix of knowledge within which you can operate and that's that's the sort of the roadmap that i was i was telling you about it's kind of like kind of like google earth for spiritual seekers wow that sounds absolutely fascinating tell us why early church fathers were so afraid really of the gnostic teachings why were they made to be kept hidden for so long what what is it that they were trying to repress from us and what are you bringing out about the gnostic teachings in this book well the essence of that can be summed up pretty simply the gnostics incidentally the gnostics predated christianity but they became the first christians because when jesus of nazareth conducted his ministry they recognized that he was teaching a gnostic message and um in fact um we know that there were secret teachings of, of Jesus, even the early church fathers, and even the Bible admits this. The Bible has Jesus frequently saying, unto those without he spoke in parables, but unto the disciples he gave the keys to the kingdom of heaven. Um, early church fathers like Origen and um, uh, Clement of Alexandria uh, wrote in a uh, surviving text that we have today that Jesus had a secret teaching, which wasn't given to the masses for fear that most of them would not really understand it. That, you know, just kind of like anything else, even to, in today's modern world, you have certain people that are just sort of naturally inclined or clued in um, to understanding, having certain understandings and other people who have different focus without, would not really get that. So they were, they were really, teaching the gnostics were really teaching to though what they called the elect those people who were spiritually intellectually um intuitively ready to receive higher teachings the core gnostic teaching and the difference between the gnostic christianity and orthodox christianity was very simply this the gnostics believed in emanation not creation okay they believed that the world was emanated which is actually a projection of the source essence itself that, that was projected outward in, in various limited forms, increasingly limited forms of consciousness that culminated, let's say, in us, which was spirit in material form, spirit in material consciousness. Um, but but that, that we were projections of this very essence. There was no separation between us and the source that projected us. We were just simply outcroppings of that source. That's what emanation means. Now, creation is a wholly different thing. Creation is when something is separate from that that created it. So, for instance, Pinocchio was the creation of Geppetto. Geppetto was the creator. Pinocchio was the creation. They were clearly two separate things. Well, that's how Orthodox Christianity viewed creation, that uh, they viewed in creation ex nihilo or out of nothing, which is kind of like God waving his hand and creating human beings out of the dust of the earth. We were separate, cre we were separate creations. So we, we did not have a direct connection with, with uh, the source. Now, that's, that was very convenient for a hierarchical church, right? Because if you don't have a direct connection, that justifies the need for having intercessors like the priesthood and the, and, and the, uh, whether it was the Jewish priesthood or or the uh, Christian priesthood and um, the church, you know, all said, okay, well, you know, we're we're your ticket to God. You know, we're the we're the way that you can reach God since you're kind of this, you know, you're kind of something different from God. You're separate from God. 
And it actually had a great effect on our civilization because when you think of it for a second, the core message of Christianity is that we're something separate from God. And by the way, we ticked God off through original sin, and now we're forever trying to get back into his good graces, kind of a lowly conception of a human being. The Gnostic conception and the ancient spiritual traditions had a much more exalted view of human beings, which is that, you know, we we are God or we are a, a part of the essence of the source, albeit in a very limited form, but still that thread, that divine thread connects us back to the source. And we don't really need a church and we don't really need a priesthood to intercede for us. And the interesting thing about it is the contradictions in the Bible are pretty glaring because if we were separate creations um, and we are sort of something outside of God, why did Jesus always say that the kingdom of heaven is within? Look, look to the kingdom of heaven within. If you want to, if you if you want to achieve enlightenment, why? All right. So, so the reason is is because vestiges of Gnosticism exist even throughout the Bible and create these contradictions. You know, or the Orthodox did a good job of erasing the the Gnostics, but they couldn't completely erase the truth, and the truth still crops up in different passages in the Bible. It's a great overview of a very complicated subject. Thank you. And, and that's a really good point, Samantha. It is a complicated subject. And then when you bring in the emotion or the conditioning or the uh, ancestral lineage that people have with organized religion to step out of that box and look at it from a different perspective really changes things. Because I know one of your one of the things that people can find on your website is a whole um, synopsis of this work. But you bring up that the early Christianity, there was a psychic connection. And I know many, many people that Samantha and I have spoken with and worked with are really conflicted with their natural ability to connect with spirit and what they've been taught either through the church or family lineage. So how do you bring those two together to normalize isn't really the, the right word for it, but to it is just part of who we are when we tap into the collective energy of that quantum field. Well, look, for, for, one, for one thing, don't trash everything to do with traditional religion, okay? I mean, I, 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 uh, I think that there is still a lot of value and great intellectual thought. If somebody really understands the breadth of Catholic thought and tradition, there's still a lot in value there. But there's a lot of BS, too, okay? And, and you know, you don't, but you don't need to throw out the baby with the bathwater. Um, I'm obviously... Uh, you know, churches and fundamentalists, they're going to be down on spiritual expressions. It threatens them, you know, because again, uh, you know, they're, they're, uh, they're taught to keep on the straight and narrow. There's a certain dogma and teaching their thought that, you know, that they're taught by, by others. And uh, they basically put their faith, not in themselves, but they put their faith in the words of their preacher or, you know, who are their church or, you know, whomever. Um, take responsibility for yourself. You don't need them. I'm not saying that you shouldn't listen to them. They may have some, some things of value to say to you. But when it gets to the point where they try and tell you, oh, stay away from this and that, don't, you know, don't, don't conduct anything that smacks of inner exploration, draw the line right there because they're doing you a disservice at that point. Um, you can, you can, you know, I, I mean, I still consider myself a Christian of sorts, uh, more like a Gnostic Christian. Um uh, and uh, there's a lot of things about uh, Christianity that I, I think are, are great. Uh, I certainly would not be described any longer as an Orthodox or, or Catholic Christian. Uh, my uh, family priest was not too happy with me at certain points. But um, anyway, um, you know, that, that, that it really, what it really gets right down to is the fact that if you understand that you are a part of uh the source spirit, and you can call it God, the divine spirit. I, I don't care what name you give it. It's all the same thing. But if you understand that you're part of the source, then there's nothing scary about trying to um, get in contact with that source. If, on the other hand, you buy the fact that, you know, you can only get there through what the preacher or the church or whatever tells you, then, you know, you're going to be too scared to step out of the box. Don't be scared. It's not going to hurt you. Uh, I mean, I mean, yeah, you, you do want to make sure when you contact, when, when you when you have these experiences with higher consciousness, you're getting good information because it's not to say there's not bad information out there. Um, I mean, there are such things as, um, you know, forces that are less enlightened out there. 
But I think most people are mature enough that they can um, delineate when they're getting information that's positive and helpful. And again, if that information proves out to be true in the real world, and real, and I use the real world in quotes, our perceived real world, um, you know, then you you start to get uh, validation of of. of the, you know, that something, something good is going on. And that can come in the form of dreams. It can come in the form of direct, um, somebody, you know, speaking in your head, uh, it, it can come in many different forms, but, um, you know, don't be, don't be scared. Give it a try. You say that consciousness is the creator of reality. Do you mean an individual's consciousness? Do you mean the collective consciousness? Where exactly are we originating in a quantum level the energy to be creators of our reality? Well, it's all of the above, but in in varying degrees. So uh, I, I I do believe that the basic the basic creation itself is a continuous projection of a supreme source. And if you look at it like a stream, okay, to, to try and picture a mountain stream or mountain lake, let's say. And that mountain lake is the fountain from which everything springs, from which everything is created. It's the purest expression. But streams of that lake flow downhill. They flow down the mountainside. Okay. And the the more they go down, the more they sort of collect pollutants and mud and everything else. And then, you know, it gets down further down, it gets a little bit muddy. Well, that that's kind of how I view um that's kind of how I view creation. I mean, at the source, the things are the purest. The further things move out from the source, they're more subject to limitation. And limitation means errors can be made uh, and illusions can be uh, held and so forth. Uh, but you still have that, you're still part of that stream, that water, that water that flows down, you're still part of that. And you can re kind of reverse engineer and rise up towards that more more pure source and get more more pure information so in the course of uh of uh, consciousness creating we are part of that creative force albeit in a more limited sense the best example i can use is think of a power grid okay in an electric power grid you have the source which is the high energy and it has to be stepped down in energy in order to be able to be utilized in the average household. So you have the transistors, you have the relay stations and so forth that finally get it down to the use of the household. Well, the source itself is like the power source, the electric power source. And we're like those relay stations. We participate in the stream of that creation, albeit and, and, in a collective and the collective and individual sense, uh, albeit in a much more diluted sense than, you know, we're, we're, we're ramped down energy. We don't have the energy of the source, the awareness of the source, but we do have it in degrees. And that, that can be enhanced. That energy can be enhanced. The closer you start to move towards the truth of the light and an understanding of how reality operates, you, you, really do increase your level of awareness and increasing in consciousness increasing awareness is the same thing as increasing energy because consciousness is energy consciousness is energy transmitted it, it's intelligent energy transmitted through the vehicle of light do you see it as a partnership with that higher source at the top of the mountain for example like when jesus says ask and you shall receive that's telling us that we have to ask an outside source. And I don't know if that's been mistranslated after the Gnostics, you know, released it. I don't know. But what do you think about that? Are we co-creators or are we just in charge of clearing that source and co-create and creating what we want? Well, you know, we're, 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 we're like I said, we're co-creators in the sense we're part of that, that stream that created everything. Okay. However, um, you know, we, we had a lot to do with warping the course or intention of that stream uh i'm not 100 percent sure that we were we should have been down here in physical form uh, perhaps perhaps we we were perhaps we we weren't um it could simply be that spirit was looking to express itself in all possible forms including spirit energy in physical form which is probably the toughest thing to do so how does that really happen? How does how does spirit energy energy get contain, contained in in physical forms like a human being? Well, again, 
it's by limitation and think about it in in this manner it's it's about individuality you can't be if you for this the source is everything and if the source is everything how does it become something how can it how can everything become a something well the only way it can have the perception of itself as being something is by projecting a limitation of itself and that limitation of itself is what forms the basis of individuality okay in order for us to think of ourselves as individuals we have to be limited because if we had the same consciousness of the source well we'd be absorbed right back into the source itself we wouldn't be individuals so the price of individuality is limitation and uh when you get to the extremes of that limitation you start to really forget the source where you're from and you start to use that creative ability to um produce things and forms that aren't necessarily of the highest order and the most desirable so in the ancient texts there were hints that uh that the that the um and and I'm I'm not just talking about the gnostics but even if you look at the Edgar Casey Casey story of creation which is really fascinating um it was spirit sort of misusing power for its own ego for its own gratification as opposed to using it in tune with the will of the harmony of the source and we kind of went off on our own to experience our our you know our own our own programs uh and uh and those programs um you know weren't always necessarily of the highest order I mean look at look at look at life on earth here not 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 very easy I mean there's beautiful things here but there's also a lot of horrible things here um it's a very it's a very mixed bag well you know a per, that, that a perfect the perfect source would not have created something I think this flawed uh it, you know I I think it was a misuse of the source at limitations with limitations that created this and there's there's many different I mean even in Orthodox Christianity there's a very early writing called uh the writings of Papias P-A-P-I-A-S and essentially he said it was the angels who created the earth not God they were given latitude uh, I guess through three free will and they messed it up um uh, there was an early sect of uh uh Jews I think they were called the um uh, I'm trying to be it was like the Megarans or something like that a sect who believed that this is what happened that the earth was uh created through uh lower forces of lower consciousness um the Gnostics themselves tell the story of the creation as being a um a function of uh, almost like a mistake or a lower consciousness that eventually uh manifested in physical reality so all these different traditions have some kind of a story of the the you know sort of like the conscious energy being warped into um more limited channels that that didn't produce let's say the you know the highest results you know, I find that absolutely fascinating because I have read that a lot of the Gnostic early teachings believe that the fallen angels might have created Earth. And I, I don't know if that's true or not, but I find that interesting to think about. And it would explain a lot of uh, negativity that does run amok in the world. But I feel like what you're doing with your book is showing us a different path, a different way. Instead of focusing on, you know, why is the world negative? Why is this happening in my life? But going within to use the power of our unconscious to really create what we want to see in our life. And yet so many times people will say, well, yeah, I know I need to create this or I need to change that or I need to amend this but they still stay in the same rut they've always been in. How how can quantum, understanding spiritually these, these quantum mechanics of how our unconscious works, how can we use that to help us get out of these ruts? So I, I think that um, even people who engage in meditation or begin to engage in meditation, if they just do it in a vacuum they're not going to get the best results and what i mean by by that is that i always believe in doing my homework before i start on anything and doing my homework means i try to take in you know the big picture i try to take in the breadth of the landscape there which me and in my case um you know like i said i studied spiritual texts and um i uh uh i studied quantum physics and i put a lot of things together and I created a sort of framework for understanding. And what what that what that really helped me do was, you know, you know, see, I I have a little bit of a dif difficulty in conveying advice to people because 
my experience was so spontaneous. I'm one of those few who kind of like had a you know spontaneous <laughs> Gnostic experience or whatever. Um, but not everybody comes to it by that path. Most people don't. So uh, I had to sort of reverse engineer everything I did. And um, what I'm what I'm telling you now is sort of, you know, based on my my thoughts of um, working backwards of how that can help other people. And what I would say is that most of us have been trained to operate off of faith. We've been trained by the church. We've been trained by our governments to have faith in church and have faith in governments. Okay. Now, faith, uh, I'm not going to deny the power of faith, not so much in government, because I'm not a big believer in government, but, uh, you know, in terms of spirituality, I, I'm not going to deny, uh, you know, faith as being a good thing, but it's of a lower order. And what I mean by that is that faith is something that you have to take uh, second or third hand from something that somebody else tells you. The thing about that is that that faith could be either well placed or misplaced. I mean, people had faith in uh, you know uh, Jones down there in Jonestown, and they drank the Kool Aid, you know, and that's uh, that that's where faith can be misleading. It's not always the most um, productive thing in the world. But the the higher order of understanding is knowledge, and and by knowledge, I don't just mean book learning knowledge, intellectual knowledge. I mean having a direct experience with the source or divine consciousness. So I can tell you that fire burns, right? But you don't know that for a fact until you put your hand in the fire. Now, once you put your hand in the fire, you own the truth of that. That's the point where I'm trying to get people to be, to go beyond faith, to um, to have that knowledge. And, in, and the way that I've done that is in the book, like I say, I have this multidisciplinary pro approach and I give a platform of understanding and people and I and I tell people you know you don't have to believe what I'm telling you. In fact, when I speak nationally, I often start off my 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 talks by saying don't believe a damn thing I'm going to tell you. And everybody sits there scratching their heads saying what I pay to come to this thing for. But you know what what I what I'm explaining to people is you I want you to hear what I have to say and absorb what I have to say and test the truth of that inside of your own, you know, inside of your own being. But at least look at least I've given you an arena for thought, like a like a road sign on your journey. Uh, what I've done essentially is I'm kind of like a road sign. And, you know, it, it, it gives you general direction. But, you know, you're the one who actually has to determine your path. But at least you have a basis to start off on. You have a platform of awareness. And it's like I say in the early chapters of the book, you can live down in the basement or you can live in the penthouse. If you're down the basement, you can survive. You can have your steak dinners. You can go to the movies. You can have your family and everything else. You know, you can survive. But you're really not understanding the panorama of life. You want to move up to the penthouse where you get that whole breadth of understanding, of reality, of what, you know, of what the world might might be about. And, and you know, the more you climb up that that that, that building to get to that penthouse – more and more revelations become available to you. More and more things seem to resonate as either truth or falsehood. So you start to be able to discern what's BS and, you know, what, what might really be. So, um, you know, I, I think uh, I, I, I would say to everybody, and the short answer is create a platform, however you feel you can do that by reading, by meditating, by understanding, but create that platform that when you go into meditation, helps guide you a little bit. So you're not aimlessly roaming around. You you have certain directionals that you can focus your meditation on. I'm I'm a big believer in focused or active meditation, not to say that the passive or Hindu type of meditation is bad. Um, it's not, and I do that sometimes too, but I find um, anything that helps me set my intention. And if I understand more about the factors that go behind why I have that intention, the more effective my meditation is. Yeah, well, I think sometimes when we have focused meditation, it it helps us focus our thoughts and become more aware so that we're not in that rut I was talking about before. Or I, I think Colin Wilson called it the robotic mind that so many people live by. There's a really good book by uh, Thurman D. Cumont. It was written in the 1920s called The Power of Concentration. And he talks a lot about how you should do focused meditation because it it helps you to actively take control of of your thoughts because so many of the the things that we're creating with our thoughts are actually subconscious like we might have a thought of i should be in the penthouse 
but there's often an underlying thought that says, no way you belong in the basement. And in that book, uh, Power of Concentration, and in yours, it talks a lot about how you've you've got to you've got to get control of all the layers of thoughts you're having, and you can only do that through the power of concentration, which meditation is one of the keys. Do you well, do you feel that way that we have these layers of thoughts going on? Yeah, I do, uh, and I think look, I think that. I think that life is not so much about learning, but it's about remembrance. I think we know everything there is to know locked inside of us. Um, but there are layers uh, of, and, and the reason why there are layers is so if there weren't, we wouldn't think of ourselves as individuals in an, in a material situation. We'd, we'd think of ourselves as some other form of energy. And that's the reason why ha we have all these layers of illusion. We have the, you know, the, the subconscious, the unconscious, the conscious mind, the bicameral brain, the tri, the, the trimorphic brain, uh, all the, you know, why all these divisions, what, what's it all about? Well, it's all about helping us in the illusion of believing that we're material beings when you know we're when we're really not we're really spiritual energy that uh thinks of itself in a uh, material form and one one technique that um I, I i give to people and they find it very helpful is this so when you if you go into meditation and you have a question or you have a problem picture yourself sitting in a chair opposite the person you admire most in the world could be albert einstein let's say okay and have a conversation with albert and just say, you know, ask the pose the question, and then just be still, and then just let your intuitive mind take over. Try and put your conscious mind in the background. Just just be still and see what Albert has to say. Albert is really you talking to yourself, but it could be you, uh, the higher level of you, the higher self of you that has that penthouse view talking to the you that's down in the basement. And that technique often uh, people, uh, you know, people find that very helpful. Yeah, that's a great technique. It reminds me of uh, Napoleon Hill when he would have his business meetings with his eight to 10 leaders that he admired the most. And it was all in his imagination. But he would always say, was it in his imagination or was an aspect of the archetype of that leader actually meeting with him and giving him advice that we needed? So I, I yeah. love tips and techniques like that because they remind us that, you know, so much of our creation and our reality does happen in our thoughts. Denise, do you want to add anything to that? How can people apply this now? Because we see this great awakening of consciousness. We see people taking alternative roads to consciousness. How can we apply the concepts in your book to, I mean, my heart really believes and my soul light believes that we're trying to come together in unity as human beings on the planet. That's part of the work that we're doing during this transformation that's happening. I mean, we're talking parallel universes. We're talking Jungian. We're talking what would how does that all come together with this big surge of, of change that we're all in right now? It's, a, it's kind of a broad it's kind of a broad question. Um, look, I, I, I think the the way that I have come to understand the world and our, our place in it is that um human beings are like the fingers of god touching the face of the of this world and our purpose is to spiritualize the material and bring the experience of the material back to spirit so human beings have an exalted position of being the bridge and this is what you essentially what carl jung said we're like the bridge between spirit and and matter and uh i mean to to the extent that we contribute uh, in some manner to the betterment of our world, whatever that may be, and that could take a million and one forms, you know, we are performing a spiritual work. You don't have to be, um, you know, you don't, you don't have to be a religious person out there in a street corner, you know, uh, you know, whatever. I mean, you, 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 there's many, many ways that people can contribute to that. But also, also by doing that, if you, if you're growing in your understanding, of uh, what it means to be spiritual or what it means to have contact with um, uh, with a higher spiritual source. And usually the two of them go hand in hand. Then you're performing the other side of the task, which is you're bringing the experience of the material back into spirit and, and, and absorbing. I mean, think, think of it in a way. I mean, if we really and truly are spiritual essence or energetic essence, which is really what we are, the only way that we can experience what it's like to, to have physicality is to do what we're doing, is to fool ourselves into thinking that, you know, we're what we are. It's like, you remember the old Star Trek series 
where um, the crew used to go down to the holodeck and, you know, for a vacation. And the holodeck was like this incredible virtual experience that was so vivid that they could actually project themselves into the holographic experience and, and interact with the characters. And sometimes they almost would forget they were the programmers. Well, essentially, that's what we are. We're the programmers who have projected ourselves into this vivid program that we've forgotten where we we kind of came from. So, you know, if you start to look at things that way and recognize things that way, you know, um, every every lesson that we learn down here goes into the next life, goes into the Akashic records, goes in, you know, goes into this, goes back and gets absorbed in the source of, of spirit. And one of the best ways you can do that is by trying to be of service to other people and contribute. You're doing that in your show. You know, by having this show, you guys are doing that. By my, by me writing my books, uh, you know, I that's my way, of, my way of doing that instead of just going out and making lots of money, you know, as a businessman. I mean, that's that's my way of uh, my way of giving back. Um, you know, and, and these are all, you know, everybody can find their own way. Everybody, you know, you might do volunteer work somewhere, so many different ways you can do it, but, you know, try and reserve a little bit of time to devote to these things. Most people don't. Yeah. Yeah. I call it spiritual tithing, you know, just giving back in any way that you can. I think that is so important. So your book is getting some fantastic reviews and hype, but in addition to quantum spirituality, you have a fiction series out there. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, it's called the First Souls Trilogy, and it's about the first spirit consciousness to incarnate in physical form. And they keep reoccurring, they keep reincarnating at different critical junctures in human history when humanity will is either going to evolve or you know sink backward. Uh, it's written in kind of Star Wars reverse order. So the first book is really the third book, and the third book is really the first book. But the first book, um, which we're now working to get in a TV series, by the way, I have a uh, an associate who's uh, an ex executive at HBO, and uh, we're we're making the rounds in Hollywood right now, looking to get the um, the, the first book into a series. is uh, called Pope Annalisa. It's about an African nun that becomes a female pope at a time when America and Iran are about to go into a nuclear war. And um, she uh, she becomes Pope in a very startling way, but her own church views her as a heretic because she starts talking about things that Christian mystics did that were suppressed 2,000 years before. She starts reintroducing mysteries into the, into the church. And then the, the second book uh, goes back into biblical times. Uh, it's called The Thirteenth Disciple. It centers around Mary Magdalene and the female leaders of the early church and, and early Christianity. Um, all the characters, though, are reoccurring. In other words, the same characters in the first book, their souls are, are, are the characters of the second book and so forth. And then the third book is the book of origin that's called The Light of Distant Suns. And uh, it's when these souls first incarnated into the material world and they built this great Atlanta, Atlantis-like civilization, but they uh, eventually entered into this vicious civil war between those who still remembered their source and those who had become wholly um, captivated by materiality and, and ego and power and everything else. And they end up destroying this, um, this great civilizations of Greece and Egypt. Wow, that sounds absolutely fascinating. Before we wrap up, Denise, do you have anything else you want to add? No, this has been fascinating. And thank you very, very much, because I think that what you've compressed into a very short period of time is so very important right now with, with where we are and where we're all heading. So thank you for your work. Oh, sure. Thank you. Thank you for having me. And good luck with the HBO show. That would be exciting. <laughs> Yeah, it really would. Let's it's it, it's a I, I will tell you it's a really 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 difficult business especially post covid but we'll see what happens. Well, I mean 3 bodies down is having such an amazing run. I don't see why they wouldn't be open to something like like your work as well, you know? Well, one would hope. <laughs> yes. Well, thank you so much, Peter. You guys, check him out, petercanova.com. We'll put the links in our show notes. You can get his book on Amazon, Barnes & Noble, wherever books are sold. And remember, as always, to show up, do great work, and share your light.